Hello everyone, Carlos here. So in today's video, we're going to actually be covering how can you use Sysmon for tracking for the creation of files? And also, how can we use Sysmon to block the creation of executables? Now, this is the first time where we're going to see that Sysmon has this type of capability where we can actually block for the creation of files. So we're taking a blocking action. So now we are extending our capabilities with Sysmon. Now, you may ask, Carlos, why do we want to track the creation of files? Uh, many attackers nowadays are moving to memory. Yes, advanced attackers are actually moving most of their techniques into memory and using API calls. Now, as Murphy's Laws of Combat say, uh, professionals are predictable, but the world is full of amateurs. So we're going to be seeing many malvertising campaigns. In addition to that, many ransomware crews and others that actually drop files on disk and even professionals in that initial stage when they um, trick a user to download a file or they send that user an email or they do a social engineering lure over the phone or via chat or they convince that user to download a file on the machine and then double click it and ignore errors or stuff like that that is going to be a file that's going to be created so we can just monitor for the creation of those specific files all of this stuff is going to be under event ID number 11. And you're going to see that there's some stuff that I like about it. Other stuff that sadly I do not. So let's go over to the VM and let's take a look at this. So right now here in my VM, you're going to notice that I have a configuration file or file create where I have an include. Also, I have an exclusion because uh, under normal operations, we're also going to be creating files. So I have also here my exclude, as you can see here for file create, where I'm excluding that normal behavior. So let's first take a look at my include here. You're going to notice that I'm going to be using and with a lot. You can also do contains any and simplify this role set into single filters. Uh, but for demonstration purposes, I'm doing each file on its own. Also allows me to group them. So here I have a PE file, so XCDLL, COM, OCX. In addition to that, I have HTA files. We have been used the different scripting extensions that we have seen before on a Windows system. We have for click once type of payloads. Also, we have containers because many attackers, what has happened is that as macros have been blocked by Microsoft by default and users that do not have Office 365 have been upgrading, Macros are no longer kind of like the tool that they have been able to leverage since the late 90s all the way until now uh, that they have been abusing for so long. It's no longer available to them. So they have moved to actually use container files like ISOs, VHD, VHDX, and then they use LNK files to get execution from those or trick the user to open a, let's say, a OneNote file that actually contains the embedded files in those. That's another one that we have been seeing right now in 2023 as we're recording. Uh, we can also monitor for drivers.sys files. Why is this important? Because now attackers have been leveraging some of the low drivers that are out there to be able to then disable security controls in the machine and be able to get a foothold on ring zero on the host for persistence or even for modifying or crippling the UFI on a machine. We can also look for developer utilities like MS Build being abused for .proj or .sln files. If somebody's creating a macro, we can track who are those users that are actually creating macros and leveraging them in our environment. Macros are still useful. People actually use them. Anybody that does vulnerability management will probably have a couple of macros where they export all of their Nessus output or their Nexpose output, and they'll filter all of that stuff and have very nice reports. That's one of the things I saw in my previous job when I work at Tenable. Almost everybody didn't use the console because it sucked and they used simply a Excel file to do most of their parsing of their vulnerabilities. Also, if they use .NET to JS, that creates log files for the executable that actually ran .NET. So I'm looking for those outliers like Cscript, Wscript, WMIC, MSHTAs, VCHOs, any of those that are going to be out of order there. They're, they're not going to be 
normal in my environment. They're going to be outliers. And they have exclusions because in a regular Windows environment, scripts are created. We're also going to be ex seeing executable CLLs being created inside of that environment. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm just going to be taking a uh, exclusion for those, for example, in the case of SCCM for patches, same thing for Windows Update and some other processes like, for example, SMSS.exe, which actually creates hibernation files with the .sys extension and other files. I'm actually just excluding those from my configuration. So let's take a look at how that looks. I'm going to apply my configuration right now. I'm going to do sysmon minus C and I named this file create.exe, I apply it there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to download from Melvin's collection of already compiled .NET offensive tools that he makes available to the community for testing. And for those that are not able to compile the tools themselves, I'm going to download a file. I'm going to call it test file one.exe. <coughs> So let's download this file and let's see how it looks in the event log. I've downloaded the file. I'm going to do with psgumshu get sysmon file create event. I'm looking at event number 11. Now, one of the things that you're going to notice is I don't get a hash for that specific file that was created. This is one of those things that really makes me sad that I'm not able to get that piece of information because I think it's going to be very useful as I'm doing threat hunting across my environment because an attacker can actually modify the name of a file as it starts spreading that or doing lateral movement across my environment. But I do get the process good, so I'm able to track what process actually created that. The user, in addition to that, I get my image of the process and the file that was created with my timestamp. So very useful information still that I'm able to then create alerts for. Now, Sysmon also allows me in version 14 and above to block the creation of executable files. And those executable files, which are PE portable executables, that actually have the MC header, which are the um, first letters of the name of the developer at Microsoft that actually created the PE format. Uh, so that is going to be for MSDOS. So all of a sudden, this header is available since the time of MSDOS to modern Windows on every DLL, XE, COM, and even OCX file that gets that gets used inside of Windows. So we're able to track those. Now, I do need to provide some words of caution with this specific event. So when it takes a blocking action, that is going to be event ID number 27. It actually uses the mini filter driver. So it's able to look at the API calls before they actually write the file on disk. And if it sees that that header is present there and it matches a rule, it's going to block the creation of that file. So we need to be very careful and we need to have a very good plan and a good baseline before we start creating rules because this can cause friction across our infrastructure and it's going can be problematic so we can shoot ourselves in the foot with it so we really need to be very careful with great power comes great responsibility now in addition to that that we need to have a established process to dealing with that before we do a uh, very advanced attacker one of the things that he can actually do is that when he creates this file on disk he cannot include that header and then after the file gets created, where the mini filter driver is no longer looking at the file creation API calls, it gets another handle on the file and then modifies that header and adds that MC header to it. Now, this is going to be a professional attacker. And we know that Murphy's Laws of Combat actually say, hey, professionals are predictable, but the world's full of amateurs. So many attackers actually are going to drop files on disk. They won't know if Sysmon's present and they don't take that initial action on their droppers. It is something that, yes, we have seen, but not very often in most droppers that we see out there. So we do, all, do take that into account to not rely fully on it. In addition to that, if an AV product takes a blocking action, we're not going to be able to see it on Sysmon. 
because of the altitude number of the drivers, as I mentioned in the other video when we were going about how the Sysmon works. So we also need to take that into consideration. Also, if there's any other monitoring product, which altitude number Sysmon comes first, we're not going to see that event specifically in Sysmon being written to the event log. So we do need to take that into account also. So let's go over to the VM and let's configure a blocking action rule and how does it look? So here back in my machine, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do sysmon minus C and then I'm going to apply the default block configuration. I'm going to look at it. And when I look at this configuration, what am I specifically blocking for? If I go here, so we can see it better in XML, I'm going to be using the file block executable element. I have an include, and I'm looking for all of the office applications in addition to that PowerShell and MHTA. I can add here low bins like cert utils. I can add other tools that may be abused on a Windows system to download an executable file to disk. Uh, but in this case, for demonstration purposes, I only have this simple configuration because I don't want to shoot myself on the foot, as I was mentioning. So now this has been applied. Now let's see what happens if I try to create this file. I'm actually going to give it the proper name. I'm going to call it certify.exe. So I'm going to download certify.exe. I'm going to run this. And it's going to look as if it had success. And then one of the things I can actually do, I can do an LS. Certi asterisk there. And I can see, wait, the file's not there. Huh. So it didn't create the file, but I didn't get a pop-up. Now when we look at our event log and we go sysmon all block executable. And I look at my event, I have my event ID number 27. And then on this one, I do get a hash of the file that was blocked, which is super useful for me. And as you can hear, you can see the rule name that was used that I had there in my rule set that I can also use in my SIM for filtering. So this is very powerful. I can actually use this to block that initial access. I can then have alerts in my SIM that will alert on some of this behavior. Uh, very useful in those environments where we don't have an EDR available on all hosts. So as you can see, Sysmon does provide me great flexibility when it comes to tracking and also blocking on the creation of files, specifically executable files when it comes to blocking. Um, this is one nifty telemetry that we have there. This is super useful for us. Um, so yeah, again, I hope that you guys like the information. I'll see you on the next video.